Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the January meeting of the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority Commission. I am Andrew Taherzadeh, Assistant Director of Marketing Communications at the EDA. I am your moderator for this meeting which means I will have control over the audio functions of this Zoom call, and I will control the PowerPoint slides that will be used during the meeting. At this time, I would like to ask all those on this call to please mute their mics. Now, I would like to welcome members of the commission to the meeting. Chair Kathy Lang, Vice Chair James Quigley, Secretary Ron Johnson, Treasurer Stephen Partridge, and members Lenny Hainsworth, Rocky Mitchell, Halabi Sabu, Joe Vitalich, and Rick Wagner. FC EDA President and CEO Vic Hoskins and Executive Vice President Alex Adams are on the call, as are EDA Council Mike Graff, EDA staff members, consultants who represent the EDA in offices overseas and California, and our marketing communications consultants. I would also like to welcome Fairfax County officials who have joined us for the meeting. This meeting is being recorded. Presenting from the FCEDA tonight will be Chair Lang, Blake Hall, founder and CEO of ID.me, President Victor Hoskins, Director of Market Intelligence, Stephen Tarditi, Executive Vice President, Alex Imes, Director of Talent Initiatives, Michael Batt, and Vice President of Marketing Communications, Alan Fall. FCEDA, Commission who have questions will have the opportunity to ask questions as they normally would during meetings. If anyone from the public has any questions, please select the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom screen to ask a question or email Cheryl Martelli of the FCEDA. Cheryl's email address can be found in the chat box. We will not answer questions from the public during the meeting, but we will respond to all questions in writing afterward. So with that, I'll ask Chair Lang to begin the agenda. Chair Lang. Good evening. Uh, there we go. Well, good evening, everyone. And I hope this year has started well for all of you and a happy new year to all of you. Uh, welcome to our January meeting. We have an enlightening meeting planned for tonight. In addition to our regular agenda items, we're excited to have as our guest speaker, Blake Hall, who is the founder and CEO of ID.me, one of Fairfax County's two unicorn companies based uh, based on market valuation. He's going to talk about his fascinating background, how, his, how he has grown the company here, the culture he's creating at the company, and what is next for the business. And our own vice chair will be interviewing him. So we'll have a little different uh, take on his speaking for ten, on, the speaking, on the speaker tonight. So let's get started. First thing is to approve the minutes of last meeting. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of December 20? 21 meeting. So moved, Rocky Mitchell. Thank you, Commissioner Mitchell. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Hainsworth. Um, is there any discussion? Great. So with that, I will call the question and ask Council Graff to do a roll call. Thank you, Chair Lang. Um, I'll call the roll on the approval of the minutes of the December 13, uh, 2021 meeting of the commission. Um, Ms. Sabu, I, I uh, don't believe you were in attendance. Um, would you um, like to abstain from the approval of the minutes? I'll abstain from the approval. Okay, and similarly, I don't believe Ms. Hainsworth um, attended the last meeting. Um, Ms. Hainsworth, would you? Um, uh, elect to abstain from consideration of the minutes? That's correct. Uh, thank you. And I'll, I'll call the um, the role for the um, commissioners who were in attendance. Mr. Wagner. Aye. Mr. Vigilich. Aye. Mr. Mitchell. Aye. Treasurer Partridge. Aye. Secretary Johnson. Aye. Vice Chair Quigley. Aye. Chair Lang. Aye. I'm having fun with my buttons tonight. Okay. So the motion passed. Thank you. So I will now ask our treasurer, Steve Partridge, to present the financial report. Commissioner. Thank you, Partridge. Madam Chair. 
uh, you all in your packet received the financials for the month of December. So that puts us at 50% through the budget year and we're about 45% spent down. So like last month, we now have a full staff. So you'll see some of those numbers increase in the second half of the year. And the second half also has some of those marketing expenses we talked about last month. So I think we're right on track where we want to be. Uh, everything looks good in talking with the staff. So there's nothing really else to report, but uh, other than we're on track to where we thought we'd be at this time. Thank you very much. Any questions? Great. So as you remember, in the fall of 2020, we began a series of guest speakers to provide the commission and staff with various perspectives about a post-COVID-19 economic recovery. These thought leaders will help, help us provide a strategic vision for the future. We kicked off the series with our Fairfax County Executive, Brian Hill. Since then, we've hosted excellent presentations from area leaders, including Dr. Gregory Washington, President of George Mason University, Dr. Ann Kress, President of Northern Virginia Community College, and Brian Kenner, Head of Policy at Amazon HQ2. Last month, we were pleased to welcome Sid Banerjee, founder of ClareBridge, and now the Chief XM Strategy Officer of Qualtri Qualtrics, which announced a significant expansion here last month in Ruston. So now I would like to ask Vice Chair Quigley to take the floor and introduce our speaker. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I am very delighted to introduce uh, Blake Hall as our guest speaker tonight. Blake is the founder and CEO of ID.me, the next generation digital identity network that simplifies how individuals securely prove their identity online. Consumers can verify their identity with ID.me once and seamlessly log on to more than 400 leading brands without creating a new password and verifying their identity again. Government agencies, healthcare organizations, financial institutions, and retailers use ID.me to verify the identity of customers. The company is based in Tyson, steps from the Greensboro Metro Station. Mr. Hall was named CEO of the Year for 2019 by One World Identity. Prior to funding ID.me, uh, Blake uh, started his professional career in the U.S. Army. Thank you for your service, Blake. Uh, leading a reconnaissance platoon in Iraq, he was awarded the Bronze Star with Valor for stopping an Al-Qaeda assault on a combat support hospital in Mosul. Uh, Blake graduated magna cum laude with bachelor of science degree from Vanderbilt University, and he has an MBA from Harvard Business School. I am very delighted uh, to welcome Blake to our meeting, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to lead a conversation with him. Uh, Blake, anything you'd like to say before we, we start our conversation, my friend? Well, it can only go downhill from here, but uh, it, is, it is great to see you, James. Uh, it's been a long time. Super proud of your success. Um, and thank you for what you're doing for uh, for Fairfax and uh, for the local entrepreneurial community here. And I saw Ann Rosenblum as well. Uh, I've loved Ann. She's been a just a great supporter and champion along this crazy ride from when we were a baby company. And I didn't really know uh, what I was doing. I know a little bit more now, but um, but it's it's important to have folks like Ann uh, who help you along the way. So, and Victor, thanks so much for for having me today as your guest. That's awesome. By, by the way, I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat that too. Anne is Anne is a touchstone between uh, us two. Anne visited my company when we were four people in the <laughs> in the townhouse of a, a right next to the uh, a coffee shop in Ruston, um, and and followed us along the way. And I think that uh, Anne is a great uh, a proxy or a great story for what the EDA is 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 all about is helping organizations. Um, start and build and grow here. So thank you, Ann, for your service through the many, many years uh, to Fairfax. Um, hey, so, so Blake, we're I, I'm gonna we're, usually we have somebody sort of take the floor and provide a presentation, but I actually I, I like this format. Um, we're gonna sort of uh, tell your story uh, through through interview and 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 sort of see where our conversation goes. But thank you so much for for joining us. Um, and, and I know obviously you're extremely busy, so you taking time out to help us to understand what we can do better to help organizations like yours and why organizations like yours should should uh, start and grow here. Um, let's. I want to back up. Um, I, being a, an ex Navy guy too, uh, I, I, I I'll try to hold back my my Army Navy jokes here if I can. 
But uh, I'd love to, to, to walk through uh, your history of, of, of starting from the, the, on the battlefield and moving to the boardroom. Um, so walk us through uh, when you left Vanderbilt and, and joined the US Army, talk us a little bit through that and then obviously on through to, to Harvard Business School. Sure. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, you know, I think uh, I didn't I didn't realize it uh, at the time, but when I was going into combat in Iraq in 2006 and leading my 32 scouts and snipers, I was about to get a crash course in uh, signal intelligence and identity and, uh, and in many ways, entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, it was given a mission that none of us had trained for, um, had no real structure or training around how to do it. We had to figure it out on the fly while we were getting shot at and you know, take the bullets away, and uh, it's very similar to entrepreneurship. But um, if you've if you've watched uh, the show on Netflix called Narcos, um, uh, where uh, they're using signal intelligence to like run down some of these guys using phones and stuff like that, that's basically the Atari version of what uh, my men and I did in Iraq uh, for the better part of 15 months uh, using you know maybe the the PS I would say five version because it's been 14 years, so maybe the PS3 version of that technology and now it's like in zero dark 30 and they're using stingrays to bust weed dealers and on corners um so you know what was top secret is now uh kind of out in the broader uh lexicon if you will but um but from you know two weeks before going into combat was told uh forget everything that you guys have learned about you know reconnaissance and precision engagement three letter agencies came in and said we're going to give you this state-of-the-art equipment we're going to resource you and uh, you're going to be running kill capture missions for the next uh, 15 months, 20 minute string, day or night. And uh, when, as soon as you have an alert, uh, you've got to go out and um, and and you know action the target. And so, uh, you know, so when we when we first started, we just weren't uh, very good, to be quite honest. We were in Mosul, Iraq, in uh, in July of 2006, right after the Golden Dome Mosque in Samarra had been bombed. And uh, the theater average success rate for what we did was about 44%. And we were in the 20th uh, percentiles, which is to say that we sucked. Um, but, uh, you know, we conduct this process known as an after action review after every um, mission. And so we figured out, you know, what went well, uh, what didn't go so well, and how should we improve it on the next go round. And by month three, uh, we caught the uh, the head of the Mujahideen Shura Council, which is this umbrella group uh, of different uh, Islamist and, and nationalist Iraqi insurgent groups that were operating in Mosul at the time, and also the spiritual leader of Al Qaeda for Northern Iraq. And so after that, Colonel Townsend, who's now a four-star general, um, was our brigade commander. He made us the kill capture force of choice for all of Northern Iraq. Then. The brigade that Colonel Townsend led got redesignated as the Surge Strike Force. So we moved down into like Tartar, Fallujah, um, every neighborhood of Baghdad, uh, Karbala got the the all-inclusive tour of Iraq. Um, I don't know why we can't ever invade like Fiji or something, but uh, <laughs> I guess that's for the Navy guys as they um, as they get to travel around the world. But um, but you know uh, we kept learning and getting better, and uh, and so when we were down in Baghdad. Uh, um, for the last like three months, we had a task force night, uh, which is a JSOC unit, British SAS. And we developed these uh, daylight tactics and techniques that were highly effective. And they asked if they could embed their operators into my platoon, and they would give us tactical control and resource us with everything that JSOC brings to bear. And so for the last several months in Baghdad, you know, it was amazing. I got JSOC resourcing and was able to work with, uh, with the British SAS guys who were you could write a book or about them just uh, in terms of uh, their entertainment value, you know, every day. And and by the time we were we were finished, uh, our success rate on those missions was over ninety percent. And it got to the point where uh, the non commissioned officers, the sergeants in the operations center, they they would cast bets not on if we would get the target or not, but how many minutes after we got on site uh, we would we would get to the target. I mean, it got it got to that point. Um, and so, uh, you know, super proud of, of all my guys. Like, I, I remember uh, we all knew that Iraq was just a disaster, just kind of like Afghanistan at, at a strategic level. But for our piece of the pie, the last uh, network we actioned was a vehicle bomb network uh, in South, the South Kark neighborhood that was killing 1,000 civilians per month. 
Um, and after the SAS embedded their operators and we actioned that network, uh, we took out nine of the top 10 of the leadership and the entire level of hierarchy underneath it in less than two weeks. The Intel guys, so they'd never seen a network dismantled that fast and, um, and the bomb stopped going off. And so I'll never forget, you know, having my 32 guys in front of me and saying, you'll never see the faces of the people uh, that you saved, but there's a year's plus worth of data that shows these folks were killing a thousand innocent folks in markets, women and children per month. And now those bombs aren't going off. And so, you know, for our piece of the pie, uh, we made an impact, you know, for the good and you saved a lot of lives. And, and, and that was, um, you know, that was to me about, you know, having a mission that's, that's worthy, uh, at least at the level that I was responsible for it and the power of learning and, and just how effective you can get uh, over over time. So I can't go into like a lot of the detail about how we learned and did what we did, but I've always loved applied math and patterns. And um, and in many ways, uh, you know, I didn't realize at the time when I got to Harvard and started to look around at identity and there's like its own journey there, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, this, this process of verifying who you are, normal people have the opposite pattern of life of a terrorist. And that's when you know, when I would track targets, I would look at, they would change bed down locations and they'd change their devices and they'd swap SIM cards and they'd have uh, voice biometric couriers that would be a proxy for the Emir. And normal people do none of that, right? Like you get your phone and you have it for two or three years and like you call mom or dad and like you're not changing your SIM cards all the time and changing your phone number. And so what's really cool is like, if you can tap into a pattern of life that's very difficult and costly for bad guys to emulate, like normal people who aren't committing fraud, you can, you can really distinguish bad guys from good guys based on how you live. Because bad guys are gonna do the bare minimum necessary to try to commit fraud. And so for that reason, they're gonna have a lot of short tenure with devices and SIM cards. And so um, I didn't realize it because I was still trying to adjust from coming back from Baghdad to being in Cambridge, Massachusetts and, you know, 27 again and not, not worried about dying and having my friends die. And like, I mean, that, that was insane, like in its own right. Um, and, uh, and I was, I was fortunate enough to get into Harvard because I had a, my battalion commander is still like a second dad to me. Um, when I told him that I was leaving the army, he said, you're going to apply to Harvard because that's where he'd gotten his, his master's degree. And I was like, sir, I've not used a three syllable word in the last like year. I was like, I was like, have you been around my guys? And and he used some colorful language, you know, back with me. And it basically amounted to like, you're, you're going to apply to Harvard or I'm not going to write you the letter. And so, you know, changed, uh, changed the arc of my life. Wow. I, having been a, 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 a mentee of General McChrystal for years in the McChrystal group and uh you know, following the, the team of teams methodology, certainly the whole JSOC group, yeah. what they learned and what you guys learned during that process was uh, revolutionary for, for technology and, and how we think about uh, intelligence and gathering information, obviously identity being one of them too. That was a, a crash course for, for so many people under General McChrystal. He was amazing. You know, he had, he had developed this thing called the fusion cell uh, that brought all the different three-letter agencies together so that in real time when when information on a target was available, it was shared. And so like you didn't have Delta guys killing CIA informants and and so on and so forth. And and just the speed at which they were able to get the data to us. I mean, when you fight a decentralized network, the command and control structure of the military doesn't work. Like when I stopped that attack in Mosul and everything else, it was because I'd listened to my my guys. I knew the range of a 120 millimeter mortar. I was able to see the point of impact, plot the point of origin at its max distance in the tubes to the field and get there within five minutes to take out this battery that was shelling folks. And like you, you have to teach the organization like reflexive muscle movements and not conscious thought the same way that like sports players, when they dribble, they're not thinking with their conscious mind. They've just trained it and they're drilled it and they're doing what they do when they play because they've, they've prepared themselves for that. Really difficult for an organization like the United States military to get away from direct and central command and control to decentralize sharing of information. But the only way, um, you know, as General McChrystal would, would reiterate, the only way to uh, fight a network is with the network. And, yeah. um, and, and so that fusion cell, man, uh, we got data so much faster. And uh, 
when we were in Mosul to action a target, once I got in the, in the neighborhood, I had about five minutes worth of like information in Baghdad, when you're playing against like the senior Al Qaeda guys, like eight seconds. And so that data sharing was just unbelievably important in terms of uh, being able to, to execute the mission and, and to get to the target that we were after. Blake, obviously we're so interested in, in how you built your company. Uh, and I wanna dig into that and what we can do better to help other organizations grow. But you, you have a unique you know, perspective of having been an, uh, an, an, uh, an ex-military person re-entering the economy. And our region has some of the, the highest density of ex-military people who are looking to re-enter the economy, whether it's to start a, a company or, or, or just to get a job in the civilian in the civilian world. Can you talk a little bit about your transition and what that was like and uh, what we can do better as a region or, 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 or as, let's say as the United States, what can we do better to help uh, these veterans who are looking to re-enter uh, an economy that needs them uh, desperately? Yeah, you know, 100%, thanks James. I think um, there's, you know, there's a few layers to that. Like one, one was, uh, I, think, I think people often have a, a a different perspective on risk than than they should. Like they can perceive, you know, really big companies to be like less risky than entrepreneurship, and that's unfortunate because I, I went to school with, you know, not just veterans but a lot of talented people at Harvard Business School, and as smart as they were, many of them were not used to failure, and um, and, and I think for that reason, veterans actually start small businesses at twice the the rate per capita as your typical. Um, American citizen, and that's because I think we are we are more accustomed to dealing with risk, and we have failed, and know that it's okay. And by the way, when we fail, there aren't bullets flying, so people aren't going to die. And like, uh, I, if I can handle, you know, that I can handle, uh, you know, a boardroom or, or whatever else. And so, um, I feel like I was fortunate to go to business school during the financial crisis, you know, two thousand eight, two thousand ten, when everything was kind of falling apart. Um, because some folks, McKinsey and, um, and Goldman Sachs have like a pipeline of talent coming out of that. But I had friends who went to Morgan Stanley who got laid off. And, and a lot of these really talented people, once those options were taken away from them for this period of years, they, they put their talents and skills uh, to entrepreneurship. And so I think um, you know, funding and financing that can help really talented and skilled uh, entrepreneurs like give up those entry level offers to go in as an associate to Goldman or to McKinsey is incredibly important. If, if you can get the, the folks at our best universities uh, to take the plunge into entrepreneurship and to really embrace it and risk everything, uh, we have 2000 employees, you know, today. And like with contractors, it's like 2,500. I mean, and that's the type of like job creation and impact that you can have. Um, and I think, you know, when it comes to like veteran entrepreneurship, it, it, it really is varied because veterans are a microcosm of society. But I think what we are very used to is, is being able to control our fight or flight mechanism under pressure and to handle stress um, very well and, uh, and to just be comfortable with handling an exceptional level of risk that most other folks aren't used to. And so for that reason, uh, whether it's small business and, and as differentiated from like high risk entrepreneurship, uh, veterans typically make really good operators because uh, if it's a franchise, they know how to operate a model. And if you have folks who are more like a creative and want to start a new business model, um, we tend to punch above our weight, at least as far as what the census data shows. Yeah, we work, we're constantly looking for ways in which we can uh, help because obviously there's a there's more jobs than we have people in our region right now too. And clearly uh, any of your advice uh, along the way would be great um, for us figuring out how do we get these um, these very valuable um, citizens into our economy. Well, you know, one thing, James, uh, Patriot Boot Camp is an organization that I love. Um, and so the more that you can tie into some of those like uh, tech incubators that are veteran focused, Patriot Boot Camp does a great job. Um, and then the Pat Tillman Foundation has a scholar program. Uh, they do a great job of assessing talent. When I was at the Inc. Uh, 500, 5,000 conference, all of their scholars, if I had to pick the very best of, you know, the 200 other officers that were with me at the infantry officer basic course and that I served with in combat, the like three or four like elite folks in that group were all in the Tillman Scholars Foundation. So those two programs in particular, if, uh, if Fairfax could tap into that, would be a, a good place to start. Awesome. Thanks. 
So let's talk about you're, you're at Harvard. Uh, you obviously had some, uh, some different experiences having come from the military and um, learning about failure. Uh, and, and you're starting to think about, because you went pretty much right from there, not too long after to, to starting what became ID Me. Now, when you, when you and I met too, and this is something I'm actually really proud of for your own journey too, is that uh, you've been extremely focused on tackling this identity problem or opportunity within the military starting, but you've, you've had a couple journeys along the way. Talk us a little bit about leaving uh, Harvard and, and starting what eventually became ID Me. Yeah, you know, uh, man, there's so much naivety that goes into it. Because remember, ID Me started as Troop Swap. Uh, right. For some I remember guys. Troop Swap, yeah. When I lived, uh, you know, in a DuPont circle and I had a, a big pickup truck with like troop swap just on the back. And I'm pretty sure I was yeah. the only one in DuPont circle with the pickup truck and certainly the only one with a giant troop swap logo on the back of it uh, that was out there. Um, you, you know, and it, I had this offer from McKinsey and company to to start there. I'd done a summer at McKinsey and, and had an offer to go back Um but just in my heart knew that that wasn't what I was meant to do. You know, it didn't combat. I just seen how quickly life can go. And, and like, if, if I, I wanted to leave my mark. Right. And, and even with that offer in hand, um, some of my classmates and this, this even uh, extended to like angel investors, they just believed in me and trusted me. And so uh, I had a very close friend, uh, Brian Kaufman, uh, who's now, um, he manages like a $10 billion uh, crossover fund for Viking Global Investors, uh, who, who just participated in our Series C. Um, you know, he wrote me a check for like $80,000 for this troop swap idea. And then I met David Tisch, uh, the Tisch family, of course, like owns the New York Giants and um, Lowe's Hotels, and like all the parking garages in Manhattan. And so David met me for coffee in Boylston St uh, Street in Boston. And after 30 minutes, he wrote me a check for $20,000. And after taking that money, I hate owing people any money, like that $10. Like I just, you know, I, it was such an enormous responsibility. And my, and then my older brother insisted on writing me a check for $20,000 as well. And I was like, Russ, like I'm, my only experience is like getting shot at and not getting shot, but like, you know, that's, that's all I've done. And I was like, don't, you know, put that $20,000 on me because he, you know, he's doing okay, but doesn't have like a ton of money. And, um, and he said, he said, well, you've never failed at anything before. So I'm, and I was like, no, well, I, I could very well fail at this because I don't know what I'm doing, which is what I'm trying to tell you. But anyway, you know, taking that money really changed um, my focus and like outlook. And, and I had to go back to McKinsey and say, listen, I will repay the signing bonus and do everything else, but like I've got to see this, you know, troop swap thing um, through. But between that and and some VA funding as well, that actually ended up seeding, you know, what is now ID Me. Um, those things were really influential. And around the same time, uh, David Tish put me in touch with a gentleman named Kelly Purdue. And so uh, all the things that you're taught to do in business school about putting vesting in place with like other folks who are working on the project, and I'd done none of it, right? So, cause I'm like, oh, we'll just like do this thing. And then, you know, one of the guys, Mike Slaw, who's now the founder of Shift and uh, Andreessen Horowitz back company, um, he was going into the Navy. He still owed the Navy his, his obligation coming out of the Academy. Uh, um, Matt Thompson had accepted a job at uh, Goldman Sachs in Los Angeles. Uh, Abram Walters was going to Boston Consulting Group. Um, and then I was the only one who said, you know what, I'm going to pull out of this McKinsey thing and I'm actually going to like focus on this full time. And so, uh, you know, Kelly, the first thing that he did, he was a, a military officer, like one season two of The Apprentice and like, you know, Army Ranger and all this other stuff had, had built and sold like four companies. Um, he really took me under his wing and but he said, look, if I'm going to mentor you and everything else, let me see the cap table. And he's like, oh man, we've got to get that sorted out, you know, first. And so I went back to all those guys and said, hey, listen, I'm, I'm not going to McKinsey anymore. I'm going to do this full time. And with Kelly's help, was able to, to get them all down to like, you know, minimal levels, like 1%, you know, um, or less in terms of equity ownership, because they weren't going to be part of building uh, the company. And so having Kelly as like a mentor uh, to help, you know, uh, guide me along the way was, was really, really important. And then um, I uh, this this the second best piece of advice was uh, David Tish, 
um, said, you know, listen, if you're going to do this technology entrepreneurship thing, uh, you need to read Steve Blank's book, Four Steps to the Epiphany, because it really is the application of the scientific method to building a company. And I was like, well, I know how doctrine works. And like, I'm an infantry guy. So FM 7-8 is like the Bible for all infantry officers. And like, it turns out that Steve Blank's Four Steps to the Epiphany provides, you know, a, a, a framework, the scientific method for how you build a company stage by stage. And um, in reading that book, proved invaluable. So I think, you know, James, for the, like the first uh, year or two out of business school, as, as I was kind of really in search for a business model and product market fit, um, that sequence of like getting the cap table structured appropriately, having early investors who just were willing to bet on me as, as a jockey, if not, you know, the horse I was on was definitely an ag. Um, and, uh, and so it wasn't that. And then uh, having a mentor who'd, who'd done it before, you know, those were all like the key ingredients that allowed me to, um, to kind of get started at least and have, have a shot at running a few experiments to see if they stuck. Talk to us about, so you, you, from TroopSwap, clearly part of this, you were bumping into the ideas that ultimately uh, became ID Me. But walk us through the sort of the, the kernel of the idea that became ultimately ID Me um, and, and its journey through there. So talk to us about the problem that you're trying to solve there. Yeah, so there there were a few things. Um, the, the first thing was, uh, I thought there was an opportunity to disrupt uh, Craigslist, you know, and, and I think like if you look at how markets develop and economic history is is something that I love because I think you can identify patterns a lot better. You had kind of like Henry Ford and the Model T and then you had Alfred Sloan at GM who came around and was like, Henry, not everyone wants to drive like a black Model T. Like they want, you know, cars that are per like, I want a pickup truck with troops off on the back. And so GM, you know, then trounced Ford in terms of market share. And I thought, there was a real opportunity to have um, like a military focused version of Craigslist and then students. And then maybe just like Facebook use students to grow, to have a, a classifieds and like a local marketplace that was overlaid with trust that like, this is a military person or a teacher. And so that affinity would, would provide a sense of community that's overlaid on top of that marketplace. It's just very difficult to get started. You know, you have the chicken and egg problem of enough content, enough eyeballs, and how do you do that? And so um, I started courting USAA and uh, military.com to say, well, you have the eyeballs so you can get me, you know, the, um, the, the buyers. And then if you can bring the buyers, then that allows me to kind of cultivate and get the supply side going. And maybe if we get that going in a few key markets like Hampton roads in Washington, DC, this could be useful. And so, um, so that's, that's what it started as. And as I was talking to USAA and, and had great conversations, this is like late 2010, um, maybe two weeks passed after I met with them in San Antonio and I called them in, uh, in early February. And I was like, you know, listen, like Tom, like what's the timeline for this to move forward? And he goes, well, fast for us is like 18 months. And uh, <laughs> he's like, but par for the course is two years. And I was like, oh my goodness, like two years until I get to run an experiment that may very well fail. And, and by the way, we all know how corporate projects work. Maybe it just gets pulled one day at a meeting and they're like, sorry. <laughs> so, meanwhile, I'm living on a couch. Uh, so I wasn't willing, you know, to, to wait that long or to do that. And so the, that was the low moment. I called up Kelly in February of 2011. And I said, listen, I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. And he's like, for, he goes, first, never say that to anybody ever again, because no one will write you a check if you tell them that. And he was like, second, chin up. He's like, we're going to figure a way out through this. And, and I'll love Kelly Purdue for forever, just because of his character and what he was like, you know, when, when the moments were hardest. So I decided to do a few things. I had about, I don't know, eight or $9,000 left of seed money and about $6,000 left uh, in my personal uh, checking account. I had student debt at the time and uh, I'd been coming down to DC quite a lot uh, because VA was there and, um, and General Chrisman, who's on the board of USAA, uh, lived down here. And I decided uh, to, uh, to sign a $50,000 lease on a house on Swan Street uh, outside of DuPont Circle, 1739 Swan Street. And because uh, I figured out that office space versus rent, it was cheaper to do it Silicon Valley style and to come down here. So that was a huge burn the bridges moment. I mean, I had like $14,000, no real income. 
and I signed a $50,000 annual lease. So whether that's confidence or foolishness, you tell me, but, um, uh, and I was, you know, didn't really have a plan, you know, out of it. So there were two things they did as I said, well, maybe we can take this like uh, classified model and pivot to daily deals. Cause living social was like all the rage at the time. And certainly military discounts are a staple of kind of life. And like, you have all these retailers. And if I could like tap into that, then maybe I could get going there. Um, and what I, what I did is I, instead of asking USAA to do this big deal, I said, well, listen, the one thing that I really need to enroll people, because we'd seen this during the mocks was I need to be able to verify that they're a part of this community really quickly because we're spending half of our developer cycles and like trying to verify that they're actually eligible to join before they even get into the app and start dealing with it. And I'm losing so many folks. It's just not sustainable. And so I still can't believe we pulled off what we did with USAA and our champions there. He's like, I'm not, he's like, I'm going to activate the shadow procurement organization, which bypasses like IT and legal. I mean, when they found out about it in like 2013, I think the CIO referred to it as the IDME disaster <laughs> in terms of like what they had done to like enable us to get going. But uh, I still, I still cannot, cannot believe uh, what some of the folks over there did because they just believed in the mission and like what we were up to. And, um, and so, so that, that pivot to the, the daily deals model allowed us to run an experiment to see if there was, you know, product market fit. And, um, and that's when we actually debuted that website and um, we got access to USA's APIs in April um, on the, on the back of that access that we gotten. And then the, uh, the engineers I was able to hire, we launched, you know, the MVP of troop swap as a daily deal site in May of 2011. Um, and then closed the second tranche, uh, for just under a million dollars, I think in like October of that year, uh, as well. So I was able to cover the home and take a small salary and, um, and that, you know, that gave us enough runway to kind of get going. And so happy to talk about the evolution from there, James, unless you guys have. Any yeah. yeah. It was just, uh, as you're talking about, cause obviously that, that, that changed over time. To, to this larger issue of, of mm -hmm. uh, you know, a real, a real problem we have, which is identifying ourselves online for who, you know, are we, who we are <laughs> yeah. clearly has become a, a, a large and growing issue is uh, let's say more and more of the economies had to move online, even in the last couple of years. Yep. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how the, what ID me is, is doing yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I'd love to learn more too about, you know, you, you, you've recently moved to, to, to Fairfax. Thank you very much for that. We, we love your new building too. Uh, awesome location. Uh, we'd love to learn a little bit more about not only what you guys do, but, but why doing it here, um, uh, uh, why you're doing it here. Yeah, so, so a few things happen, right? Um, I, I'm very analytical and, uh, and as we did the daily deals model and got that going, um, I looked at like active churn and passive churn. So like how many people were actively subscribing and then there's like a, you know, not even a half-life to email addresses. It, it just like tails off very quickly in terms of responsiveness if you want to email somebody uh, every day. And I saw that like the true churn of that model was like 10 to 11% per month. And that's when I, I would talk to folks at Living Social and I was like, I don't know what you guys are seeing, but usually these metrics are pretty constant, agnostic to scale. This is not sustainable. And like, I know y'all have like a billion dollars or whatever, but I bet that's burning up pretty, pretty quick. Um, so I just was, con I was convinced pretty early after three months of data that it was not a sustainable business model. It was not like e-commerce and other models that are sustainable and can be applied in different ways. And so at that time, um, kind of the same ask that I'd had of USAA, there was, uh, there were various companies that said, you don't really have any users, right? You got like 40 or 50,000 users. That's fine, but that's not really interesting at the scale of Microsoft or Sam's Club and things like that. But what you've done to be able to instantly verify if somebody's a member of the military through access to USAA and then DOD data and, and things like that, they're like, that is super interesting. And we would pay to deliver that experience within our own website. So this is now, you know, fall, winter of, uh, of 2011. And, um, and at the same time, uh, President Obama uh, announced uh, the national strategy for trusted identities in cyberspace and said, uh, hey, uh, it doesn't make any sense for folks to create a new login at every government agency they go to and for the government to pay Equifax over and over and over again. Why don't we just verify them once and then let them take their verified identity 
uh, you know, with them across these, these websites. So, so that was kind of going on, on like the legal side and then the group side. And I was like, huh, I was like, well, it, it doesn't really make sense. You know, we all hate the password problem. And so imagine a world where every site that offers a military discount, you have to prove that you served in the military by uploading documents and waiting for somebody's help desk review to do it. And then Microsoft's marketing manager was like, we don't have a way to verify online. It'd be too expensive through our call center. So we make people show up in person to verify like that way where we can physically examine their credentials. And, and then I'm like, well, the government has this problem where identity and login is not consumer centric. It belongs to each agency. And so now LexisNexis and you know, Equifax sell your data 30 different ways. What if you could empower people to have a credential that works like Visa, but really much more multifaceted than Visa because multiple ID cards where you verify who you are once, you store that in a wallet or login, and then you can release that pre-verified credential you know, within seconds at every other site that you go to, like PayPal for identity, right? You can attach multiple payment mechanisms to PayPal, and then wherever PayPal is present, you can very quickly uh, check out. And so, uh, so I was, you know, trying to figure out at this point, you know, we'd raised a um, million dollars. We raised another like, you know, bridge, I think along the way. So we'd raised $2 million and I went to uh, New York city where Andy Dunn, uh, who's also an investor, founder of Bonobos um, and, uh, and Red Swan Ventures. And then Dave Eisenberg, who's a great entrepreneur as well. Uh, who's an investor and uh, Andy Ratcliffe. And, and, and I was, Listening to Andy, Andy Ratcliffe started uh, Wealthfront, and he's like a Hall of Fame venture capitalist at at Benchmark, um, and you know taught and lectured at Stanford University. So I was at Andy's place, and the founders of Venmo and um, and Warby Parker are there, and uh, and I, I was talking to to one of the the Warby Parker founders, and he's like, "Is this? He was this your first company?" And he's, and I'm like, "Yep." And I go, "He goes, how much did you raise?" like, you know, two and a half million. He goes, don't fuck it up. Big stigma. <laughs> and so, so I, you know, I had this train ride uh, back from New York city where I was like, yeah, what we're doing right now is not sustainable. Like, and, and I could, you know, power my head against this brick wall and just wait till we run out of money and fail. And that's one way to do it. But if this is my one shot and if, you know, I've, I still have a million dollars, you know, plus left the capital left. I'm going to take my shot where it counts and like no regrets. And so that Monday when I walked in, I was like, Hey, listen, like this is what the market's telling us. And this is what we're going to do because this is where the opportunity is at. And the the team to their credit, you know, got, got behind me and moved. And so the, the first iteration of what is now ID me, uh, cause we're a, we're a digital wallet. You know, that's what we do is like your login is your wallet. And then the more ID cards you tie to it, the faster you can prove who you are. Um, across sites, just like the more ID cards you have in your wallet, whether it's your AAA card or your CVS card or your legal identity, the faster that you can prove different aspects of who you are um, in the real world. And so, uh, you know, so, so I, I, th- I thought a lot about identity and I'm like, yeah, like when I was in the military, I could take my ID card to Home Depot and get 10% off. I could also get physical access to the same, to a military base. I could get into my military email, you know, um, and I could, board an airplane. And so like, it was the same credential. It was just authenticated very differently. Like the Home Depot cashier wasn't authenticating my military ID anywhere close to what the military base guard was doing. And so I'm like, well, why doesn't that just exist digitally? Right. We're like, um, if you're getting, you know, 10% off Under Armour, password's fine. If you go get your healthcare records in the VA, well, you know, there's going to be a higher level of authentication that's required because the risk and the value of that transaction is just so much higher and, um, and so Troop ID was like the first ID card that we published within our wallet, but it was really like a targeted experiment um, to see like, will this work? Like if we just do it for the military community. And as soon as it did, um, you know, we rebranded uh, as ID.me. I think I bought, uh, I bought the domain in late 2012 from uh, Vuxon and Predrag. It's uh, from the domain of Montenegro. Uh, they wanted, I think, half a million dollars for it. And I got it for like $20,000 because I was like, look, I'm not going to pay half a million dollars for it, uh, but I have $20,000. And the White House just wrote a blog about us. And I know that PR and everything else for your .me campaign with Visa and everything is important. So I'll commit to renaming the company ID.me. And so we uh, we got the domain in like late 2012. And then as the experiment 
from Troop ID that launched with Under Armour in their checkout flow, uh, VA on a pilot, and then randomly Telluride Ski Resort in Colorado. We signed up, uh, I think, something like 48,000 users in 45 days, and um, and then I knew we had product market fit. And so from, from there, it became, well, how do, you, how do you expand, you know, like Facebook went from students to the mass market. So it's like, how do you go from military to, to everybody? And that's where NIST gave us over $5 million in grant funding as part of that national strategy for trusted identities and cyberspace. So we use that money to meet the NIST standards to issue a uh, legal identity for all Americans uh, that verifies that you're you where the federal government recognizes us as a legal provider of, of digital credentials, like a digital DMV for all intents and purposes. And I was like, well, you know, if, if I'm like Visa and I wanna be everywhere that my folks wanna be, where do military folks go? They go to the VA. So we should probably go close the VA. When you go to the VA and you're like, 30% of all the military folks who are online already use us at all these different sites. And we're driving, you know, all the savings for military families. We are the logical choice for single sign-on. So we won the VA in like 2016, um, and uh, and you can you can go to va.gov right now and see that we power all three of those logins for the identity verification and multi-factor authentication. Uh, we did a really good job there, and uh, because VA is in healthcare, there's the opioid crisis and all these state laws that have been passed about electronic prescription for controlled substances only to fight the opioid crisis. They point to the same NIST standards for legal identity. But then they also need medical credentialing checks like of an NPI and DEA number to verify if somebody's a medical provider. If only there was a company that could do legal identity to the NIST standards that also can verify different groups and communities and credentials. And so now 127,000 healthcare providers, over 10% of the providers that have RX privileges in the country use us every day to securely prescribe narcotics and controlled substances online where we help fight the opioid crisis where my, my wife's a physician she had her paper pad very easy to compromise and commit fraud with uh, which is why all the states have passed this legislation um california you know linked their uh their their dmv records to to voting registration so when you applied for a license you were registered to vote they didn't want certain foreign countries messing with their election and so when they reached out to the white house you know and like 2016 or 2017, uh, the White House was like, you need to talk to IDME because they are the best company in this space at authentication. So now we're at the California EDD, uh, California DMV, California EDD, the Workforce Agency, California Department of Public Health, and various programs within the city of San Diego. Over half of all Californian adults have created a login and have verified some aspect of their identity with IDME, which is crazy. Um, so then, you know, and then Senator Wyden from the Senate Finance Committee wrote a letter to Social Security and said, VA is how you do good authentication. Guess who's now a login? The Social Security Administration, it's us. And, and now as we head into tax season, we're the login for the United States Department of the Treasury and the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, we have 68 million users. Uh, we sign up over 150,000 new users a day now. Um, you know, and uh, it's it's crazy, and like the sky is the limit in terms of, uh, of of where of where we can go. And so, as as we realize, like the the, the problem with identity uh, that we unpacked along the way is that in this country, anyway, your most portable logins like Facebook, Connect, and Google, they're not trusted because they're advertising companies. So, healthcare, opening up a bank account online, if we ever vote online one day in this country, it's not going to be Facebook or Google that verifies it, that you're you. At the other end, in the, like the trusted but not portable logins, it's your login with your employer or with your bank, but those trusted logins aren't portable. And it's because like the last thing that Jamie Dimon wants to do with 100 million Americans who've been verified and put through know your customer checks is to let them sign up for like a FinTech loan from SoFi where it would lower his switching costs. So identity is a moat around his business uh, that keeps other people out, which is why they invest so much in branches and everything else that are branded only for Chase or Wells Fargo. And so I'm like, well, portable logins aren't trusted and trusted logins aren't portable and our economy is digitizing and all these you know, big rock things are coming online. And so as I just looked back into history and was like, well, why are driver's licenses the national IDs for the country anyway? Happened by accident. You had, you had a society that was urbanizing due to the industrial revolution uh, we weren't all in villages anymore where everybody knew each other. And so everybody also needed to get licensed to drive because you had this guy, Henry Ford, with the assembly line. 
And after you went through the DMV experience, everyone was like, well, I can't imagine anything that's harder or more miserable than that. So we'll just trust the like credential that came out of that thing. And it, and the driver's license, bam, you know, becomes our national ID because it's tied to automobiles. But for the digital economy, the insight wasn't that like DMVs are the natural providers of the future. They're not. You don't drive online. The insight was the, the government has a monopoly on the benefits they provide. And if you want to drive, you're going to do whatever the DMV in your state says you have to do if you don't want to be arrested. Similarly, if you need to interact with the IRS or Social Security or VA, you will do whatever they tell you to do in order to get access to those services. The private sector does not have a comparable equivalent to that. Everyone's got competitors and substitutes. There is no substitute for the Social Security Administration. Whatever the rules are for their stuff is what the rules are. And so if you can tie a digital identity utility to that, no matter which agency that individual interacts with first, IRS, VA, Treasury, doesn't matter. Once that identity is tied to that login, it can now be reused across a network at no marginal cost, um, and you can re-monetize it, like Visa, right? Like once the network's established and the credentials and the endpoints are out there, every time that card is swiped, a quarter, you know, goes 25 cents goes to Visa. And, and, and it's to everyone's benefit because the amount of time and money they save consumers and merchants is, is way, way greater than that quarter that they're taking away from them, which is why they're ubiquitous. And so, you know, our, our what we are doing for the process of login and for identity verification is exactly what Visa did for Payments And as we become more adopted and we add more ID cards, you know, for workforce credentials and employment, and maybe one day if our houses are wired up for digital access, instead of like hiding your key under a flower pot or giving somebody the code to your garage, you open up your app and you like say, hey, I'm like going on vacation, you know, to, uh, you know, whatever the Caribbean or the Cayman Islands for a week and like, could you watch my fish and like get my mail and I'm going to go ahead and get grant you access to my home for that seven days that you could do that through a digital wallet, uh, just like we do digital room keys right now for MGM across the country and, and save, save people the wait in line at Vegas, which is the worst part of getting to Vegas um, or National Harbor even too. So, so yeah, it's, uh, it's been, it's been crazy, James, but uh, yeah. I know our friend, our mutual friend, Sean, at, at, at what was personal, who tried tackling this too. Our area has been tackling this. It's, it certainly looks like IDMEs are, are the best shot at, at really tackling this from, from a, a nationwide perspective. We're, we're, I know we're so very proud. I'm very proud of, uh, of your journey, having started at, at Troop Swap and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and where you've taken it here. But let's talk a little bit about th this region as a as a region that can help an organization like yourself continue to grow. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your decision to, to, to move, let's say to stay in this area. Clearly you could have moved this anywhere. Um, yeah. when you, in between those two changes of companies, especially too, there's a lot of fluid changes and you could have, could have gone to the West Coast. There's maybe more famously, more access to capital apparently. Um, uh, but why, why here? And then specifically, you recently moved to Fairfax, but We'd love to know, you know, specifically about Fairfax, but talk to us a little bit about this region's ability to help you grow. Yeah, well, you know, we've been in Fairfax for a while because we were on Jones Branch Drive in you know, 2013, 2014. Oh, so that's then, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we moved to 8280 Greensboro, um, yeah. the, you know, the Alarm.com building. And only recently we have our logo on the building, which uh, was definitely an emotional moment uh, for me. But um you know, we found a lot of our early employees uh, were out in a, like Leesburg and somewhere in DC. And so Tyson's was like the natural intersection point where it was a manageable commute for everybody, kind of like the center of, of a few different triangles. And so for talent acquisition, being able to recruit from both Northern Virginia and from the city was important. And certainly that Greensboro Metro made a huge difference on talent acquisition once the Metro, because this is right before, you know, the pandemic and now remote work is a lot more common, I think. But at the time, uh, that made a meaningful difference in terms of our ability to recruit from the district and to have folks, you know, come into the office earlier on. Um, I, I had a compare and contrast, you know, experience with DC and Virginia as well. Since since I was still in that townhouse and we were operating out of it, it took me two days in DC government offices waiting in like various lines to get my like home business license. It was miserable, and and like I was dreading getting the business license in Virginia when we were opening up in Jones Branch. And I like walked in to the office and they're like, do you have your application? I'm like, yep. 
they're like, here's your license. Good to go. And I'm like, wait, what? And they're like, yeah, like, we'll, uh, we'll mail you an invoice and just send the check back and you're good. I'm like, good luck. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. So like <laughs> the experience was so much more pleasant in Virginia versus DC that I'm like, if that's indicative of just the future overhead and pain that we're going to go through, I do not want to deal with like all those bureaucratic hoops. And so from the very first touch point of how business friendly the state would be or the Commonwealth would be to us, um, you know, that was really important. And then I'll also note uh, CIT was an early investor in the company as well. So, um, so like right now, uh, we raised at a 1.5 billion post money uh, for our Series C in March. There were secondaries uh, where our stock, not the Series C stock, but other classes like the common and seed and stuff, were trading at a $3 billion valuation in June. Um, so right now, if you take like the low end of what the stock would be on a secondary is like three and a half billion dollars right now, the $409,000 that CIT invested is worth more than $30 million. Uh, it's like an 80 times return on investment and it's still, it's still going up. Right. So, um, so that, you know, that, that impact too, like that, that capital is meaningful. Uh, there's a reason why the return is that high. It's because CIT invested a significant amount of money when the risk was still very meaningful and material. And so, um, and then finally, the reason I picked the area was that uh, the, the customer base government is obviously key to becoming the identity layer for the United States of America and to doing what we needed to do. But I also fundamentally believe that it's good to be different. In fact, I think the only point of having culture is that it makes you different from another company. That's, you know, that's what, when I walked into Ranger School, the scroll above Ranger School says not for the weak or faint of heart. <laughs> like, it's probably not what most marketers would want to talk about their brand, but like, it attracted people like me that wanted, you know, that challenge and knew that it was going to be brutal uh, when we walked into there because we wanted to be a part of that way of life. And so, you know, when I, what I saw here was an area that uh, didn't have a lot of companies that looked and felt like us in terms of the Silicon Valley, you know, high growth unicorn. And if we could get kids from Virginia Tech um, and the University of Maryland and, um, and even Georgia Tech, you know, farther down, they're every bit as smart as the kids at Stanford and, and, you know, the other in Berkeley and the other schools that are out there, Caltech and stuff like that. The culture though is different in that if you go into the government contractor culture, it's going to teach you different habits. And I'm like, well, I know culture and I know how to teach habits. What I want to do is I want to attract talent that wants to be in this kind of environment, but here uh, in Northern Virginia. And so, um, so it seems like it's, uh, it's working out. Okay. Yeah, I know. I know you're very passionate about culture, and and you know, some people might think organization and culture is the oxymoron of people from the, from the military. But I, I clearly, having gone through uh, the military myself on the on, on the naval side, I, I'd say it's the it is it is actually true. I think culture and and certainly management leadership training is is born and, and raised in in the military. Talk to us a little bit about how important your culture is. Uh, in, in attracting uh, employees and, and what sort of employees are you looking for? How can, uh, you know, how does the area continue to help you to find the right employees from a cultural perspective? Yeah, thanks, James. Um, you know, I think, so this is again, something that I think culture is talked about a lot, but not really well understood. And, and when I was a young officer and I first took over recon, recon's a special, uh, you know, part of the military community where it's, it's merit-based and for the first time, I wasn't just like given, you know, folks that I had to work on and, you know, deal with, I could pick who I wanted on my team. And so then the question is, well, how do you assess and evaluate whether you want one scout or sniper versus another, you know, and can they run for days? Are they smart? Um, do they have the skills that you need, you know, and, and I kind of did my best to sort through that. But it was really ad hoc and like instinctive and gut driven. I didn't like it. And even and even as I looked at other companies, you know, if you look at the Enron values of excellence and integrity, what does that mean, right? You know, and obviously it didn't mean anything at Enron, but it doesn't mean anything. And so, um, so, so what I did is kind of reverse engineer culture based on my own experiences and observations of employees. And, and also I love Aristotle. Aristotle is my favorite philosopher. And all he did was observe humans and understand like what makes them act a certain way and how do incentives kind of interact with that. And and um, Aristotle's, you know, quote is like, we are what we do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. And that's because 
and and so there's there's so much truth and resonance in that. If you listen to like the FBI profilers talk, like the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. You know, the reason why Tom Brady's got so many Super Bowl rings is because he's developed habits that make him great. And that's why you can trust that when he gets on the field next time, he's probably going to be, you know, pretty good. And so, um, and so there's all that learning. And again, it's science. And, and I read this uh, post by Google and I'll preface this by saying, I think Google's a little bit like Thomas Jefferson, like what they wrote isn't necessarily like what they do, but, but they put together like great uh, research out there on if you want to, uh, to have a, a hire that is aligned to your culture and good, um, you need to do a, a cognitive evaluation for just general ability, how quickly do they learn? Uh, and that's what very familiar with me at McKinsey. You take incredibly bright people who are taught to to think in structured terms. They can take an industry or company they have very little familiar, familiarity with and like break down a complex problem into digestible chunks. Then you do a skills evaluation for uh, for the the job that you're after, and then you do a structured interview. And this is where like culture kind of really go, goes into play. And if you do those three things well, the R squared of um, and R squared and regressions leads is like probability, like how much does this explain it? So cognitive to successful hire is a 26% R squared. Um, skills test to a successful hire is 29% R squared. And then uh, structured interview to successful hire is 26% R squared again. So you get to like, you know, an 81% chance of a successful hire uh, if you are able to do these three things effectively. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Like they've done the research and quantified how important each bucket is. And they're all relatively equal when you look at it. And so what, what we did is for cognitive, we wanted to, to evaluate, you know, especially for engineers, right? Like how do I take an MIT engineer versus some kid who dropped out of high school and like know if, if they're equivalent in terms of how smart they are? Well, there's other tests that you can do. So we have like the Wonderlick test for more entry-level employees to give us an idea of their cognitive ability. Whereas the kid who went to MIT or whatever, we already know he's pretty smart. It's pretty difficult to get into those schools and like you have to have standardized test scores, whatever. But it levels the playing field for non-traditional hires. So if you see a certain cognitive score there for somebody who doesn't have a degree, you can be like, that kid's every bit as smart as like, you know, the Caltech guys and the MIT and the Stanford folks. So like, cool. So scale of one to 10, how smart are they? Skills test is harder because it's more purpose-driven. Engineers, it's code. Salespeople, it's like maybe mock role play. Marketers, it could depending on what they're doing, it could be copy or graphic design, whatever. But then the culture part of it is we define our culture not in terms of uh, ambiguous values uh, that everyone should kind of get behind anyway, uh, but behavior. And so our first company value is don't be a jerk. And what we mean by that is if you cannot control your fight or flight impulse, you are not welcome at IDME. Um, and it's, it's really interesting if you give structured questions to screen for that. Um, and, and if you also make it clear that there's going to be a feedback loop to their former coworkers, you will get honest answers. You can, you can ask things on one track of like, do you think it's okay to yell at people at work? Have you ever made anyone scared to come into work? How would your former coworkers describe you? Right. And so, um, and so you, you can, you can create these questions that screen for like, is this, an, is this a stable person um, who's generally kind to, to folks, right? We also uh, have, you know, treat each customer like your favorite family member, which is really about empathy. And so a question uh, that would be on that interview track would be, t tell me about a time where you did somebody for something when it, when it didn't benefit you at all. Somebody who practices empathy and kindness in their life is going to have plenty of value of, of examples of when they help somebody when it didn't benefit them to do so. A jerk and somebody who doesn't have empathy, it's going to be an awkward moment because that's not something that you can kind of readily make up on the fly about when you you help somebody. And and so and then as I thought about, I've never had a positive working experience with a pessimist ever. So inspire people with your passion is a value here at IDME. And what we mean by that is we want optimists. Uh, we love critical thinkers. We love skeptics who challenge the rigor of our thinking. But we want people who buy us to like can do and a glass half full. Um, the folks who buy us to negativity always drag a team down. Um, and so, so, so you know, the, and that's always compete. Like I, even if it was a sports team that was losing like four to nothing in soccer, but they all like did their best and they didn't turn on each other. You would, you admire that they did their best for what they could control. And so we, we screen for that. We look for the track record of competition and empathy and emotional stability 
And that is really what our culture is about. It is very smart, kind people who love to compete and win and who have empathy and who care and are mission driven. And, and if, and, and so there's like three different interview tracks and there's a rubric for like, if they answer the question in this way, they're either immediately disqualified or it's like a serious ding. And so, you, you know, for optimism, you can ask Rorschach lot questions like, you know, what do you want to do next in your career? The person who immediately gravitates to talk about what they don't want to do, pessimist. The person who talks about like, I love this and I'm very passionate about that, optimist. And so the more structure and science you can put behind all three of them, that's how you can hire, uh, you know, 2000 people. And, and I get so much feedback today where like all the folks that are like, I, I have yet to meet a person at IDME who is not kind. And like, I, I will hear that from multiple people in a week. You know, I have yet to meet an asshole yet at this company. And like, man, the amount of smart people who have humility here, it's amazing because humility is a byproduct of, of confidence. And being a jerk is, is a byproduct of insecurity. You compensate for your insecurities by de demeaning other people to get to make yourself feel better because that's really how you kind of feel about yourself inside. So if you can screen those things out, you create this really, really positive culture. Um, and, and that was the best of the teams that I worked with and the, the type of folks that I love to work with. And um, it, is, it is super humbling uh, to, to have kind of gone through that growth and, and learning. And that's why even with my only experience in business have being people shooting at me, uh, the one thing I am able to do is learn very quickly and learn in a structured way. So it's not ad hoc, it's based on like science and consistency. And I think all the best companies have those, you know, hallmarks and traits. And, I, and, and to the extent that, th that culture can really be taught in, in a scientific method way, um, the more companies here that kind of get it and understand what habits might align with their specific business or industry can do a lot better job of attracting the right kind of talent. Because once you know how it looks, you, you want to advertise it so that people can self-select in or out of your culture. The Marines are very good at that. The few, the proud, you know, they don't want everybody, which is awesome. Um, so you know, I think the more that companies understand that and get better at that, I, I wish I'd learned more of that earlier on, but I really kind of figured it out in 2017, 2018, um, had done enough right in the early days to manage it when we were at 50 or 60, but right before we started adding hundreds of people, put this process in place because I knew if we didn't do that and if we screwed up the alignment of 1,500 people, there's, there'd be no way to recover from that. I love how you you frame that too, and it sort of leads to our last question here. But that it's sort of interesting as you start thinking about how you've curated your your best team members and ultimately built a foundation that becomes self supporting of not you know letting in only A players who who are, are who want to help everybody win versus you know personally have a win. You sort of think of the region as a whole, looking at it that way. Who do we want to? Uh, you know, advertise for from a workforce perspective. You know, it's the optimists who have empathy and uh, who can control their fight or flight. You know, mechanisms. I, I I think that's that's amazing. And it leads to my last question too. What can we do as a region to to foster more organizations to to start their journey like you did here? Um, what what can we do better? What can we do more of? You know, the the events that I loved and like miss uh, from the early yeah. journeys was like the community within DC Tech that exists, you know, and you had um, guys like Jonathan Pirelli and like Fortify yeah. VC and the events that they put on and, you know, the, the ability to do the demos and the pitches and to win like, you know, $5,000 on a big check and just to to network. I think I met Anne at a Cooley event uh, that was like a pitch session and that's where I got plugged into, you know, Blue Ventures and that group. And they've now invested millions of dollars into IDME and Mike Kostoff and Jay Gamble and those folks over there are just wonderful humans. Um, in the early days, it really is about networking uh, because the beautiful thing about American entrepreneurship is that there are so many folks who become employees in the early days that don't work at the business. Um, that's why folks like Ann are really special along the way because uh, they just help you because they wanna see you succeed and thrive and win because it's a cool thing about American culture that we do that for each other, we lift each other up. And so the more that Fairfax can, can cultivate that DC tech community, 
we've we've lost it. Like Peter Corbett uh, was a very big organizing force. Yeah. He since moved to New York, but we used to have the Six and I in the synagogue or whatever. And you know, uh, Don Rainey from GrowTech would you know was bragging about the billion dollar raise, and and now Don's in North Carolina and Peter's gone. And you know, I, certainly I've been all consumed with like the the hyper growth stage of IDME, but. Um, but for the next crop of entrepreneurs, like the folks that came up like you and I did, James, I think those wow. events are just so critical to, to making those early connections with this, the angel groups and folks, you know, you'll find future employees and engineers that hang out around there that kind of look at the companies that are coming up in the area. And, um, and I think that's the best way to kind of see the next crop, if you will, uh, of companies that are, that are going to make it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we are missing some of that, the capital connection. There was a lot of these events that created these collisions that weren't, weren't just about creating connections between the capital uh, and the companies, but between connections like you and I. We probably met at one of these events, I'm sure, back in 2011 um, uh, at, at, at something like this. You're right, the area is, is kind of gone through a, you know, cycles of where these events have been at a, a nadir, and, and it's probably been at a at a lower point in the last, I mean, certainly the last couple of years for sure, but probably in the last half, you know, five, six years. Yep. Yeah. Frank Gruber and Jen Consalvo at Tech Cocktail. I mean, there were right. all these events and I don't even know that, you know, right now they're more, it feels like vendor driven or, or whatever. Um, these events were just more community driven right. from founders and, and just folks who wanted to help nurture and get along. And for that reason, I don't know. It's kind of like how I feel about like the eighties or just like an innocence and like level to it. And if we could recapture some of that, those spirit of events, um, be cool. Well, I'm going to leave you the floor. Any final words? Uh, uh, the, the audience is, is yours. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I I've talked enough that I'm tired of hearing myself talk. I, if anybody has questions or yeah. anything, I'd love to turn I'm... it over to any of the commissioners, uh, uh, who have any questions for, for, for Blake, um, so Blake, this is Kathy. Um, I, I could listen to you for the next two, three hours. I'm sure you'd, you'd really like to do that. But I mean, to transition from your military career to being an, I, I mean, you must be a one of a kind, honestly. Um, your story is, is amazing. And thank you for your service. Um, go Army, beat Navy. No, I'm sorry. It's go Navy, beat Army. Okay. No. I, I live with a, uh, no, a Naval officer. Perfect. Okay. So that, that's the truth of the matter. <laughs> Uh, great game this year. <laughs> oh no! Oh, oh yeah. No. yeah, it was a it was a biggie. Anyway, I, I you know year. one of the challenges for companies is to sustain that culture. Yeah. You know when you two thousand. I mean, it, you know, what's your vision for how you're going to sustain it? Um, many times, organizations have multiple cultures. So just mm -hmm. any thinking about how you're going to continue to hold on to that culture and yeah. and yeah go ahead oh go ahead i'm sorry no no i i i'd like to hear what you have to say about that you're you're right in the sense that um scale brings its own challenges because you have more levels of management that need to like really administer and, and reinforce the right. culture and so what what i've looked for are like ways where you know how do you how do you scale like yourself and the story and and so even onboarding becomes incredibly important. And, and one thing that I realized early on is like, I can't get to know everybody in a 2000 person company the way that I got to know folks when there were 50 people or 25, you know? And so I created videos that walk them through like year by year, kind of what we've covered here. Like, this is what happened here. And they're like five to 10 minutes long for like, this is what happened 2010 to 2011. Here's what happened 2011. And so uh, they all like know me and the story and the history. And it's not like reading about some dry corporate history. Like it's more like a podcast or video blog or whatever. We're like, that's part of their training about where we, where we come from. Um, I think not only codifying, but then celebrating our values as they're lived and, you know, culture, culture is what gets you promoted and recognized and compensated more and so as long as those activities stay aligned with what's written on the wall, and as long as um, I model those behaviors and the executive team models it, and we reinforce it through our incentives, we got a pretty good shot. Yeah. At, you know, and then there's a lot of learning and development uh, that needs to be aligned to it as well. Um, but that's, that's really what I stay you know, kind of very focused on with, uh, 
with uh, Anand, who's our, our chief people officer. He was at Bridgewater for 10 years, worked with Ray Dalio. Um, and then uh, most recently was at, was at Compass um, before we were lucky enough to, to steal him away over here. And, um, and so a, a lot of the, the pruning and polishing is like looking for signs of bias uh, in managers and in scoring and stripping out the bias whenever uh, possible to compensate for it. But our, our employee engagement surveys, I think top quartile for tech is like 74, 75%. Uh, I believe we were at 88 or 89%. I mean, it's like we're That's way, incredible. way above um, where most tech companies are at in terms of employee engagement. Well, congratulations on that. Keep up the great work. Any other uh, questions from other commissioners? Definitely want to open up the floor to our other leaders. Hey, Blake, it's Rick Wagner. Um, yeah, thank you for that. So it's been, it's been uh, really good. Thanks, uh, one of the things that I, that I really resonated with when you said burn the bridges and I think to me, growth, whether it's for an individual or for a company, is when you take those risks that you've thought through and said, okay, I, I, I'm going to do this and I know I'm going to do this. So I'm going to burn the bridge behind me because I'm not going back. And I think the takeaway for us as a commission is how do we put people in that position here where they can take those chances yeah. and they know that it's, it's the right thing to do and, and, and maybe sometimes they need support. But I, the, the real big takeaway for me is that, hey, I'm not going back. Yeah, 100%. You know, it's been, I definitely have so much of an appreciation for like capitalism and the way that like capital markets work and everything. And, but we've been hyper efficient too. I mean, we raised, we, we raised $40 million to get to a $1.4 billion pre-money valuation, which if you look at like, I don't know, if you look at Crunchbase or anything else, that's remarkable. Like almost all of them have raised hundreds of millions of dollars by the time they get to unicorn status, where it's like 20 to 30% of the company's value is just the invested cash. And, um, and I think it, it is an individual and a company level healthy pressure cooker where you have to find out creative ways to use scarce resources and to get to the next level. And it both changes the efficiency of your approach and your thought and the same thing is true when a company only gets, you know, $2 million versus a Silicon Valley company that might get 15, figuring out how to run enough experiments to validate truth and get to the next level is a lot harder and it forces you to be creative. But the companies that emerge from that, right, where they weren't, you know, given as much of a subsidy and like they had to learn the hard way and the operating discipline of like, you know, knowing what it is to run a, a company that, you know, will be profitable uh, one day and um, is is really important. Like when we, when we raised a bridge financing in 2014 from USAA, I still remember Vic Piscucci is on our board now. He said, treat this as like the last money that will ever come in for you. And, and that was a huge moment for us. And, uh, and we, we were profitable, you know, in, until our next raise with like FTV capital and until we closed the VA. And, um, and so both at the individual level and also at the company level, understanding that like, you've got to be able to swim on your own and not to be propped up, it is as long as long as you're in the Goldilocks zone of long, you have enough to like figure it out. Um, th those are always like the best environments to 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 grow the company in terms of operating for efficiency. Team, other questions? Thank you, Blake. Um, this is awesome. Um, it's, it's, it selfishly was a chance for me to catch up with you, my friend, and uh, yeah, uh, it, great to to to, uh, to to hear to get the new story uh, and the updated story. Thank you so much for um, uh, not only your your, your service, uh, but for cr creating a lot of amazing jobs in this area and creating um, and, and and solving a, a big problem. Uh, and, and doing that right here in Fairfax County. We really appreciate it. Uh, and I appreciate the model you've created for others too. Thanks, James. Yeah, likewise, and, you know, your success with Canvas was was awesome. And thank you for, for helping to develop the economy. And uh, you know, my last closing thought is that we're a unicorn now, but uh, definitely plan on being the first dragon uh, for the, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not gonna be too long before we're there. So, uh, and I don't awesome. say that lightly. Yeah. Well, we will look forward to having you back then too. We'll talk about the, the, the journey from unicorn to dragon. Yeah. Awesome, Thank my you. friend. Thank you very much, Blake. Awesome. We'll see Thank you. you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, Blake.
Thank you so much. Wow, that was wonderful. Thank you, James, for bringing Blake to us. And um, what a phenomenal, uh, what a phenomenal conversation tonight. I just have a couple of comments um, and then we'll move through the rest of the agenda. Uh, as you know, our strategic planning session is on February 18th from 8.30 to 12.30. We're working on the agenda right now. Uh, the main focus is gonna be on, on talent. So you will be seeing that agenda soon. Uh, so we're gonna be looking at um, some research. We'll be looking at placemaking, what that means today. We'll be looking at the supply and demand side of talent, and then, of course, talking about what, what kind of impact we can have as, a, as an organization. Um, and in March, we're excited to have Teresa Carlson, who's president and chief growth, growth officer at Splunk, a leading data and security company in San Francisco, is going to be our speaker. So with that, I will turn it over to our president, Victor Hoskins. Thank you so much. Chair Lang, I have to say that I, I was blown away by, by Blake. He's, he's an amazing individual. Um, I'm going to ask the staff to be very brief uh, because we are at 721 and we would, I know we'd like to end this meeting soon. <laughs> and um, what I would like to do is have them go through their slides uh, briefly. But if there's anything that you want them to dig down on, we can always roll back and, and dig down on that slide or you can just go ahead and stop them. Uh, next slide, please. So tomorrow I have the great opportunity to introduce Commissioner Savu at the, um, at the Entrepreneurship 101. She's doing a wonderful presentation. I don't know if you really um, have heard her story, but when you hear it, you will be absolutely mesmerized. Next slide, please. I also have the opportunity to do an in-person event. I've been very careful about in-person events lately. This will be a, a, a very well spread out um, luncheon uh, with the Asian Chamber. Um, they've asked me to come on to, to give some, um, um, some comments about what's going on in the, um, in the community right now and what the county has been doing uh, to help um, businesses, um, really small businesses in particular, uh, make progress. Next slide, please. I also have the opportunity to induct the board members, the new board members at the Tyson's uh, Regional um, uh, Chamber of Commerce, which is, I think is very exciting. Next slide, please. And this, this guy here, Dr. Sham from, um, from GM, GW, I cannot say enough about how wonderful this person is. He has, everywhere I've been, every year uh, that I have worked since um, 2011, he has made a group of students available to solve a problem for the organization I'm working, working with. And this is the third one um, he's doing with us. Free consulting services. They work in teams. The presentations are amazing. They come up with great ideas, and we've actually used some here. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm going to move on to Stephen Tarditi. Stephen. Thank you very much, Victor, and good evening, commissioners. I'll keep this short and sweet. Uh, the market intelligence team is excited to unveil our newly developed economic indicators dashboard. Um, next slide, please. Or as we're calling it, the Fairfax County Pulse. And I want to give a special thank you to Teresa Rhodes, who was instrumental in creating this data visualization tool that will not only provide us with monthly and quarterly updates, the state of uh, the county's economic recovery, what, but will also provide comparatives and insights as well. Uh, so let's dive in. We've been talking month by month about unemployment rate, and we, we talked about how it raised that April 2020 10.2% peak. Uh, but the interesting thing is, if you were to take this chart to, the, to your left here, the unemployment rate over the past four years and overlay that to the uh, previous financial crisis or the recession, uh, it took about 10 years for Fairfax County to get back to, to 2007 level, 2007 economic or unemployment rate levels, where we're already close to 0.4% away from there. Um, uh, as far as our labor force uh, participation, we're still 22,000 below uh, where we were at pre-pandemic levels. And it's interesting to note that you can see some of these numbers are dipping as the COVID uh, case surges have coming on. And, and we uh, took a deeper dive into that data and we noticed that most of those that were leaving the workforce were in those accommodation, food services, and arts, entertainment, and recreation alike. Uh, so what do we do? We get these people back into the workforce and uh, a way that our talent initiative is tackling that is with the upskilling and, and, and connecting the possible or potential employees or workforce 
with these uh, high skill and uh, high paying jobs. So uh, we have plenty of those at, at 61,000. And you can see to the right, we compare uh, pretty well to our, to our peers as far as it goes with the unemployment rate. Next slide. And as you know, the office market has been lagging where we've been seeing gains in, uh, in the workforce. And uh, right now we're at 15.3%. That's about a one and a half percent increase um, from the pre-pandemic figures. We're currently updating those figures. We should have them next month for the year and vac vacancy rate. But with everything we've been seeing with some, uh, some companies moving out and the stalling of leasing activity, we expect another significant jump. The good thing or the positive uh, note here is we're seeing a lot of brokerage firms release their Q4 reports and they're showing more of an inflection rate where leasing activity is coming back at the end of the year and uh, other indicators like sublet vacancy rates are decreasing. Um, I mentioned before about the labor force as people were leaving the labor force. Well, one positive uh, or silver lining, however we want to uh, label it, was the increased employer establishments. And we're actually at a point right now where we have more employer establishments or, or businesses uh, than the year 2011, uh, the highest number since then. So it's been good to see that we, we have this uh, you know, department, Karen Small's department, that helps these small and diverse businesses grow and, and to, um, you know, to, to really get that economy rolling in that side of that. And uh, just another economic indicator, we see taxable sales that are almost at their pre-pandemic levels. And then federal procurement, we actually set a record this year, uh, our fiscal year 2021 for Fairfax County government contractors at uh, 31 billion. And at a local level, we were only second in the nation right behind Washington, DC. So that really is our, shows that it is our bread and butter, but turn it back to you, Victor, thank you. Appreciate that. And now we're gonna move on to Mike Bat to talk about talent. Thanks, Victor. I wanna make sure you can hear me first. We've got the slides moving. You can hear me all right? Good. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. Just have a few slides here, just adding on to what Stephen was just uh, um, touching on, uh, just a little more in depth reporting here. This is from Jobs EQ that shows on the left side, the um, postings that we have from Fairfax County and the right sides are 10 jurisdictions in uh, Northern Virginia and DC. So we're about 41% of the overall open jobs across the region. And, and as you see, that excludes DC. I highlight, I highlight a few things. The, the, the tan or yellow uh, highlights show that um, something we didn't really see as much before the pandemic, retail sales and supervisors and registered nurses are popping up. So most of the other jobs are tech jobs, which is why we've been focusing on the tech cyber career fairs. But with a lot of the military and veteran hiring and, and the veteran career fairs now, we're including organizations like ANOVA and Wegmans and others to help in that, in that space. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, I, I, I might have touched on this previously, but Amazon was so thrilled with the Veterans Career Fair that we did that they came to us and said, we want to do our own. We want to do four of our own events because we're going to hire 100,000 veterans and military spouses um, by 2024. So they came to us and said, we want your help. We're going to pay for the venues. We're going to sponsor and own these. Um, but we'd like you to help drive the, the veteran and military talent to us. We loved it. Um, knowing that they're all over the place and they're hiring for every single type of job at Amazon from the Whole Foods to the warehouses to AWS. Um, and that so that really covers a lot of Nova EDA. So we we have pulled in the Nova EDAs from Arlington County, Prince William County, Loudoun County, and we're partnering. We had a great call today with Amazon um, where we're going to uh, do about four live events with them. So they're going to own it. They're going to fund it. But we're going to drive the talent to it for them. Um, with our, with our uh, EDA partners, which we're very excited about. These dates have pushed out a little bit uh, based on COVID, but uh, we're well on our way. Next slide, please. Um, last slide here is just touching on some of, uh, some of the key initiative priorities in, in H2 in our second half of the year. Um, the tech cyber career fair we have coming up at the end of this month is really shaping up nicely. We have um, 33 companies, so you can see ID Me there on the third row. Um, but we have uh, uh, 33 companies and, and can handle up to 50, but just those 33 have 7,000 openings. 
Um, and so we are um, working with DCIs doing a great job with PR and digital advertising. Uh, the communications team is going to be working on press and, and a lot of additional outreach. We already have 100 plus signed up and we're 17 days out. So we expect close to 1,000 candidates plus to attend this career fair. Um, May 11th, 12th, um, we're looking at uh, the next National Museum um, uh, event. Uh, we've, we've locked those in. Um, and that's in partnership with the museum. They want to build it into their official programming, which is just amazing. Um, they're gonna fund some of this with us now, the, the, the National Museum of the US Army, and one day will be virtual now too. A couple other key initiatives, and you heard it, we just heard it from, uh, from IDME is the you know, Veteran Employment Initiative, 200,000 transitioning out every year. So Rod's really focusing in on, on helping us expand that Veteran um, Employment Initiative. He's found an organization called Unite, us that helps bring a network together focused on help, helping veterans with um, finding health resources, social care, jobs, housing, and we're mm -hmm. going to um, partner with them. There's a statewide initiative where we have access to that for free to plug that into our talent site. Um, and the, um, so stay tuned for more on that, but very exciting initiative. Also, Rod's working to really develop the military affairs network, meaning all of our companies that have military affairs liaisons um, and, and contacts, integrate them into a network and, and build on it. So he's going to help uh, add military affairs um, uh, priority um, focus for those that don't have it yet. And then last bullet, evolving the upscaling program. We've talked about this a lot, but 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 uh, Aiden O'Lander from our team is working to with DCI on upgrading the, the upskilling page so we can do some seminars, webinars to really focus on skill through alternative routes. Um, so a lot going on in the second half of the year, and uh, appreciate the, uh, appreciate the opportunity to share on that. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Really appreciate that. I just want to say that you may have heard, you may hear commissioners how partners that we work with are now investing. Amazon's now putting money on the table to help us do something that we were doing. Now they're so we're leveraging more. The same, you know, I mean, you're going to hear this as, as a theme. It's going to happen over and over again. And how we're using our collaborative partners actually to increase our ability to draw people to help them to hire people. And I think to me, that's the most exciting thing. The, the Army Museum doing the same thing. I mean, this is this is this is beginning to gain momentum like we had hoped. Um, and I think that this kind of momentum will just continue to grow. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our last report, which is from marketing, and that's Alan Paul. Thank you, Victor. I realize I'm the last thing before, between this meeting and supper, so I'll make it brief, but we've got a lot of really cool stuff to uh, show off tonight, so let's get right to it. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So media outreach, so far we're at $21 million of media outreach of earned media value for the fiscal year, thanks in large part to uh, the big announcement last month from Qualtrics and the uh, fortune.com article about Victor and his leadership style. We're doing very well and we look forward to keeping that going the rest of the fiscal year. Next slide, please. So I wanna show you a couple of other really cool things uh, in our marketing toolkit um, that I think you, you all should know about. Uh, we're really big on email marketing. As you know, we do the eBird uh, twice a week. Uh, we also send out email blasts about various events like tomorrow's E101 session and the virtual career fair at the end of the month. Um, over the course of the calendar year, we sent out more than 1.1 million emails. Uh, <laughs> this is, I know it sounds incredible, doesn't it? Um, we sent, uh, we had an open rate of very close to 22%, which I think James will tell you is a very good open rate for marketing that, you know, that just doesn't happen in every marketing, uh, for every marketing operation. Look at that unsubscribe rate, almost non-existent. Look at the spam report rate, is non-existent. I think this shows that people find, our readers find our content valuable and they, they want to see it. So we're very excited about this. Next slide. Okay, we have this, in this fiscal year, we have transitioned our Instagram account. We're big on, on all the, uh, the big media, uh, social media channels, but I wanna talk to you about Instagram. This fiscal year, we transitioned it from an EDA read business investment account to 
work in Northern Virginia. So talking about the region as a great place to uh, live, work, play, and learn. So we started July with virtually no followers. We now have more than a thousand followers. And our uh, colleague Serena Williams has really leaned into this and been pushing what are called Instagram Reels, which are really short videos. Check out how many views the one video on cultural diversity in Northern Virginia has gotten. It was 4,995 right before this meeting started. Unbelievable. And it's because Serena and Andrew are really smart about using hashtags to get beyond our followers and to get into people's Instagram streams who are involved with other things in Northern Virginia so they see our content too. This is really cool what is what we're doing here. Next slide, please. Okay, so the talent site SEO, I gotta tell you about this. So uh, DCI started, our, D, our PR firm DCI started doing SEO work on our talent site in April, about a year after the work in Northern Virginia site went live. So if you had looked at Google in April of 2021, there was absolutely just one place, one way to get the word, to, to see work in Northern Virginia pop up on the first place, first page of Google. And that would be by typing in work in Northern Virginia. That was the only way you'd see us on page one of Google. Last month, we are now on the first page of 16 keywords. So 16 things get typed in like jobs in Northern Virginia, living in Northern Virginia, best employers in Northern Virginia. Our website pops up there now. Wow. This, this is an amazing increase in what we are able to do in terms of awareness and branding by having this kind of SEO. Next uh, slide, please. Oh, that is it. <laughs> anyway, we have done, I think we are really using our uh, the tools that we have in our toolkit to build awareness, build branding. If you remember that DCI research report from a couple of years ago where unknown was the biggest word in the word cloud, we are bit by bit chopping that down so that we don't see that again next time we do that research. So thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Back to you, Vic. Thank you so much, Alan. Really appreciate that. One last word. Um, we, we mentioned the, the pivot program from the county before. Um, today, they announced over $16 million in grants to over 1,000 companies. Um, we just think that's absolutely phenomenal. And 69% of those companies were minority-owned companies. 44% identified themselves as women-owned, 3% veteran-owned. I, I got to tell you, it's such a well-targeted program. And these businesses, their receipts were just generally down 40%. So they really needed the help. So I, I have to give the kudos to the county for the design and even more importantly, the implementation of this program. And that's the, you know, the Department of Economic Initiatives, you know, uh, led, led by Rebecca Modry, her and her team working with the folks from, um, from, the, uh, from the community um, partnership. All I can say is that it, it's just really amazing um, how many thousands of companies have been helped uh, since this process has begun. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, back to uh, the chair, Chair Lang. Well, thank you. And thank you everybody for being here tonight. I thought it was a fabulous um, meeting. Blake was amazing. Um, all of your reports are amazing. Proving the value of what we do by partners making investment. That's what they're, they're saying. This is valuable. We want to invest. So it's incredible. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Thank you very much. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. We'll vote by consent. I think that's it. Um, and then, Andrew, do you have any final comments you want to make? Yes, thank you, Chair Lang. So this will conclude the January 2022 meeting of the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority Commission. I would like to thank everyone who joined us for this meeting. And if any member from the public has a question, has not asked a question, please email it to Cheryl Martelli. Once again, her email address can be found in the chat box. For more information about the work of the EDA, please visit www.fairfaxcountyeda.org. Stay safe, be well, have a good night. Thank, thank you. you very much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.